Hello. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's very good. So initial hitches, it really happens with the electronic systems. They are not so reliable yet. <laughs> yeah, they're not. Finally, finally, we are here. That's very good. How are you, sir? Good, very good. How about you? Yeah, all right. Good. You've been practicing a lot, I think, with calculus. I saw some of your comments on my videos. That's so nice to see. Uh, have you understood all the concepts so far? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's thorough. Just obviously now it's like stuck in my brain. I want to keep it there, you know, so more yeah. practice. That's very good. Now, could you do some questions from your uh, book? Yeah, I had uh, like a topic test at the end of my book, which was like made up of like 56 questions, 55 questions. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't only, I could only do, um, which I couldn't do is only five. The you rest did 50 you did, right? Yeah. 50 you did, and only five you could not do. Yeah, amazing. I was quite surprised. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Since, um, you know, we have uh, hurriedly gone through this curriculum, uh, in about two weeks, we have covered uh, what all you have learned. Two e weeks is a very short period of time for this. Normally, it takes two months for students to pick up so much. So, um, yeah, that's a great job done by you, Amy. So you really Thanks. work with you are brilliant, that means. And uh, calculus doing 50 out of 56 questions from the book. Mm, good job. Impressed. Thanks. Impressed. So the questions which you shared with me are the ones which you could not do, that means, right? Yeah. Cool. So I actually worked on your questions so that you know we can uh, understand how to solve them. So I think we should take them today. They are all based on um, applications of your first and second derivatives, right? And uh, more or less on optimization techniques. And actually, strictly speaking, optimization is the chapter which I haven't really done with you. So I was not very surprised when you sent me that list because uh, we have still to do that chapter. So you are far ahead, and uh, I'm very happy that you know all what we have done actually you solved <laughs> those. That is great, and these five have come from those uh, that chapter which we have yet to do, right? So oh, let me okay. teach you optimization in our next lesson if required. Probably with the solution of these five, four or five questions that you have shared, uh, you should understand all the concepts, right? So let me yeah. share the screen with you and from there let's take uh, these questions and see where we are. Okay, so can you see my screen please? No, yeah, no, I can. Can you read what is the topic there right at the top? Um, calculus exam practice. Perfect, you're right at that place when you have completed your curriculum and now you are at exam practice position, right? So that makes sense because you did 50 out of 56 questions, six questions left. Some of them we are going to take today. <laughs> With that, you'll actually nail this uh, test for sure. So mm -hmm. let's review a few concepts which we learned, right? So we'll begin with some important questions uh, which we should be doing uh, to prepare for this particular examination, which is, uh, which is your exam, tell me. GCSE level A, right? Yeah. You are in year 12 at present. You have one more year to go. Okay. Yeah. So important questions for from previous test papers I've taken and actually I've shared your test questions also. So what we need to understand is questions type always increasing function. So when do we say that the function is always increasing? Mm -hmm. X intercepts and points of inflection. Can't we relate X intercepts with point of inflection, that's a new concept altogether. It is not mentioned in any book. Then we'll also find point of inflection of a cubic function. Many times students will spend a lot of time to find a point of inflection, but I'll give you a formula which will be uh, like a trick to find the solution even without doing the derivatives. And then we'll talk about minimize surface area of water trough. This is a question shared by you maximizing area of a frame another question from you right so uh, what you basically know at this stage is that when the first derivative is greater than zero what does that mean for you um the function f of x is increasing that's correct so when first derivative is less than zero it means what for you um f of x is decreasing 
how do you find a point of minimum or point is local maximum um find the first derivative yes and then um when it uh the gradient when it goes from positive to negative yes. we got your local max and then from negative to positive you got your minimum that is perfectly correct so before that you find stationary points in your particular case or we call them critical numbers since first derivative could be zero or undefined at these local maximum or minimum so we have seen for example absolute function many thirds and radical functions will have local minimum or maximum at a point where the first derivative is not defined it is a cusp or a corner correct mm -hmm. yeah. differentiate between these two in your case most of the time they are stationary points so from the first derivative we get the knowledge about the local maximum and minimum but the second derivative also helps us to figure out whether it is a local maximum or minimum uh, can you explain me how what the first derivative the second having... derivative can confirm that we have oh. local maximum minimum how can you tell me oh please? yeah because the second derivative um when we have that uh, so the concavity if yes. it changes perfect um then you got your local your minimum and your maximum so when the second derivative is greater than zero it is concave up graph is going like a parabola up right so it has a local yeah. minimum when it is less than zero concave down right and that case you hit the local maximum correct but in case the second derivative zero you can check for point of inflection and point of inflection is a point where the concavity is changing changing find the point of inflection as you know we don't have to do or relate first derivative at all point mm -hmm. of inflection is totally dependent on the second derivative perfect yeah. okay let's take the first example here where the question for you is prove that the function f of x equals to x cube over 3 minus 2x minus 1 over x is always increasing in its domain find point of inflection for f of x what will be your approach to solve this question um so since we just discussed um the keywords i would pick out would be so we're trying to prove that it's always increasing yes so if we need to find if it's always increasing you would look at the first derivative you're right and we as it says always we want to see if it's greater than or equal to zero you are perfectly um, fine yes so yeah. that is the key so as soon as you see that keyword always increasing that means first derivative has to be positive right well yeah. you know also it could be right so from zero to positive that works so and therefore you'll find the first derivative of this particular function which is power rule simple power rule and then you simplify that and what we do see that once you apply the power rule you get something like this which if you factor you get a perfect square in the numerator x square in the denominator both the squares are always going to be positive mm -hmm. and therefore the expression for the first derivative is greater than zero since first derivative is always greater than zero the function will be increasing as you move from left to right correct so that is how you're going to answer the first part the second part is to find the point of inflection how will you do that so since so you just said um, with point of inflection you always refer to second derivative yes so we just have to find the second derivative of the function yes so use the simplified form rather than the earlier form which is like a, you know a, where power rule can be applied find the second derivative mm -hmm. and then you know the second derivative is zero four plus and minus one right so it is zero four yeah. plus and minus one we need to analyze left and right side of this plus and minus one it is also not defined at x cube right but since we know the restriction is x is in the denominator we should note that x equals to zero is not in the domain so in this particular case x equals to zero will not be considered right how yes. it will be considered for your uh, checking intervals since we are only checking the values near plus and minus one we are not going that far right so we'll only analyze that particular portion correct so right. it's kind of key to us and analyzing that i left it here as such analyzing that you find that there is a point of inflection there right I, you know you, you can test it out if 
For example, you're checking at one, for example, let's, uh, let's not do it. Okay, so we have one point here at plus one, one at minus one, correct? So if I put a value which is greater than one, then this thing will be positive, right? So it'll be positive here, correct? If I put a value in second derivative, we're talking about second derivative, correct? All right. Yeah. Less than one, then it'll be negative, correct? Negative means that the graph should be concave down. You cannot hold. Positive means the graph will be concave up. And so we do have a point of inflection at this particular point, correct? So you yeah. can do this at one, and you can also do it at minus one, and then you'll see that the concavity changes at both the points, and we have a point of inflection at both these points. Important thing, again, to note is, when we say find point of inflection, you have to find both coordinates, x and y. So once you get the x value of plus and minus one, substitute and find the value of the function at plus and minus one. Does it make sense to you? All right. And so you need to get coordinates. Points, points, otherwise you lose 0.5 or maybe more marks for not writing the coordinate points. Is that clear? That's oh, what okay. we when we say exam review, how important these things are, which could be neglected at times and cost you heavily. So remember that part. So with the very first, first example, we have understood how to use first derivative, how to use second derivative and conclude our results. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Now, I've taken another question which is extremely important. I've been seen in very few test papers, but it's a challenge question. The question is, yeah, can you read the question for me, please, for this particular example? Yeah. Um, graph of a cubic function, f of x, has x-intercepts at p, q, and r. Find the value of x where the point of inflection for f of x will exist. Now, for any cubic e equation, how many point of inflections do you expect? One. Exactly one, correct? It will mm. never have more, never have less, but it will always have one point of inflection. This is a very important point on a graph of a cubic function. Most mm. of the time, you're, when you work about polynomials, you're working with quadratic and polynomial uh, cubic Right. So if you understand, you actually know, know quadratic equations a lot since you had done it for three years. Now, this cubic function is kind of new uh, and is very important from your test point of view. So we should know it in and out. So let's look mm. at you. We have already seen how do you get the turning point so many ways, right? Especially the first derivative being zero, this saddle point, these, uh, I mean, the, the turning point, right? Yeah. For you, the stationary point. Perfect. But this is our saddle point sometimes, sometimes saddle point, where we may have a point of inflection. We are now given that we have x intercepts for a cubic function. How do we find a point of inflection? So if I'm given the x into it, intercepts, I can always write the equation for a polynomial, correct? Right. x minus p, x minus q, x minus r will be one of the equations, right? Of course, multiplied by a will give you the family, right? But we will work with this very simple equation, x minus p, x minus q, x minus r, when multiplied, will give you the function with x intercepts as p, q, and r. Clear? Yeah. We can now find the first derivative. For point of inflection, we need to find the second derivative, right? So we will go in steps. So important thing here is we have product of three. Normally we are doing only product of two functions. Do you see another important thing which we learned in this right. class? So we yeah. have three terms. Now we apply the rule and do product rule for three terms. That means a derivative of first one, for example, x minus p derivative is just one, multiply by other two, right? Plus derivative of second term, which is one, multiply by other two. Derivative of the third multiplied by the previous two. Is that clear to you? So yeah. the first derivative. Now, from here, we can now apply the product rule to get the second derivative. Product rule for two now. Normally, you apply for two, right? And when you do the product rule, x minus q, derivative is one. x minus r, also derivative is one. So it's very easy to apply the product rule here and get your result. A simplified form is given to you. Okay, 
So try this out, see what you really get, and then simplify your result. So that is what you get. So you get 6x minus. See, everywhere you get this, this p term will come twice, as you can see. <clears throat> the first one, for example, the derivative of x minus q is what? 1, correct? Yeah. So you, you multiply by x minus r, so you get x minus r here, correct? Yeah. Second time when you apply, you say derivative of x minus r is 1, so you get x minus q here. Do you see that? So every term will kind of split as sum of these two. All so right. products are splitting as sum of these two. Do you observe that beautifully? All right. Because yeah. the derivative of each term is just 1. 1 multiplied by the other term is the other term plus one term multiplied by the derivative of the other term. Do you get the idea? So yeah. we, we actually split. And as you can see, how many x's are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6x. So we get the first term, which is 6x. Yeah, and then... And 2 of each other with a negative sign. So minus 2p, 2p, oh. and 2r. Is that clear to you? Do you see that? Yeah. So, so if you see it like this, you kind of get it immediately right mm -hmm. so we got our function we got the first derivative the second derivative and now we can find the critical number by substituting zero for f second prime x second derivative and of course 6x will be taken to the other side divide by 6 correct so when you solve it 6x equals to all this two times and when you divide by 6 you see that two and uh, cancels with three so p plus q plus r divided by 3 is your point of inflection, x value. Oh, and then do we have to sub the end and find the y? If I say there, there is a cubic function with x intercepts at 1, 2, and 3, where is the point of inflection? Add 1, 2, and 3, divide by 3. You get your answer. Do you see oh. that? Yeah. I mean, it's a killer. Especially when you have a multiple choice question and you have to solve such a question. You'll be given five minutes to solve it and you'll nail it in five seconds. And so for any cubic function to find the point of inflection, you use that formula? If you know the x-intercepts. So um, many times they make things so difficult for you, they'll write it in the factored form. Writing a cubic function in a factored form and then finding the derivative, you can see is how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Then, now you're using a product rule not with two functions but three functions oh. if you know the formula which is just add the x intercepts and divide by three imagine the time of times saved in with this particular trick okay yeah I actually have with you another exam practice where we are going to have multiple choice questions and understand strategies to save time while solving such questions one of them is right here oh okay yeah so next question here is, again, based on this application. Can you please read the question for me? Show that for any cubic function, f of x equals ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, um, there will be a single point of inflection. This point of inflection will always be at um, minus b over 3a. Another form of the same equation. This time I'm giving you a standard form equation. I'm not giving you a... Factored form equation, correct? Oh, okay. That yeah. means that means if there is a cubic function, any form, right? Any form, standard or factored, we know where the point of inflection is. You get the idea, right? Yeah. The formula is so simple. It is at x equals to minus b by three a. Do you see that? Mm. Minus b by three a. For quadratic equations, you use minus b by two a so many times. You remember that peak? That yeah, yeah. For cubic, it is minus b by 3a. So you can remember easily is your point of inflection, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So simple proof that I just saw this typing error here. Okay. <clears throat> so you'll begin with, see, I'm not doing any uh, anything like this. Very simple terms. I have the standard form. I'm just writing this equation. F of x is the standard form of cubic equation, right? The first derivative is 3 times ax squared plus 2 times bx plus c. That's my first derivative. And the second derivative will be 6ax plus 2b. To find a critical number, I'll equate the second derivative to 0. That means 0 is equal to 6ax plus 2b. What is x equals to? Well, 
I'll just divide minus 2b by 6a and get my result, which is minus b by 3a. Done. All right. Do you yeah. see that? Have you ever seen it like this? No, actually. No. That's so handy, especially in exam conditions, to be quick. So but any equation you look at, I can find the point of inflection. Any yeah. equation. Do you understand? And what mm. you're going to get talking about polynomials, quadratic or cubic. The cubic equation will be a challenge question worth actually, you say one plus two plus three marks, something like this, right? In yeah. your consistent. So this could fetch you six marks for just a second. You understand? Very Yeah, nice. so yep. for both of those, um, the one we just saw previously, yep. and for this one, yep. they both only work with cubic functions. One is in facted form and the other is in standard. Yep. So the idea was, you know, seeing your test papers and even other test papers here, IB program or any program, the uh, one set of question is on a polynomial. It could be a quadratic equation or it could be a cubic equation. So quadratic equation, we know in and out. We know that formula is minus B plus minus square root of B square minus 4 AC divided by 2A. It's such an easy formula to find the roots, correct? And you're mm -hmm. working with quadratic equations so well that you can actually nail that question without any problem. But with the cubic functions, it's kind of difficult. Even to factor them, we have to trial and error and then do long division, right? And then... Yeah, that's true. So cubic equations sometimes will take a lot of time without getting the right result. However, in the examination, the questions are what? You need to find point of inflection most of the time for a cubic function, and it has only one point of inflection. At least without doing anything, you have a result, right? In your mind. That's the beauty, right? It could yeah. come to you in factored form or in standard form. In both cases, we have a result. Mm, that's true. Right? Yeah, because if it was only one way, then we would have to start converting, and that would take a lot of time. Yeah then, yeah, then there was no point, right? And we yeah. just got both the rules from the basics, right? So they will work for any equation. Is that mm -hmm. clear? That's true. So just remember these two rules. And oh, there is your question. It's very familiar to you, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So can you please read the question and then we'll see how to solve it. Okay. So a 4,000 meter cubed water storage tank is shown with a vertical uh, isosceles right triangles at the two ends and a horizontal top ADEB. Find the minimum surface area of the tank if the width of the top AB can vary. Yes. This, uh, yeah. And this word, actually your question had a lot of wordings and like mm -hmm. it had five more statements. So I just made it into simple thing. It's given that this is an isosceles right triangle, so 90 degrees right there, correct? Mm -hmm. And isosceles means only the legs will be same, correct? So they are same, correct? Yeah. We are saying let this let be, normally we say opposite A will be A. Right? So what we say both are A because uh, they are isosceles triangle. And only thing which is supposed to vary is X, which is A, B. Well, when X varies, everything varies. But the idea here is we are saying that when you want to differentiate the equation, differentiate with respect to x. And that is why in the equation it is mentioned that the x varies, right? A, B is x and x varies. Do you understand? Oh. A, all these things will vary, correct? Of course. If I have, a, I mean, because we have fixed volume, correct? So if you have a fixed volume, if x varies, it has to be, correct? Or when we say that x varies, that means differentiate with respect to x clear um, that's a key thing yes. yeah see what? i knew what differentiate thingy is but yeah. like when the word vary i didn't make that link so that's why i got confused only thing changing and changing oh. will take care by rate of change the gradient right and this gradient is with respect to x is that clear to you yeah it makes sense yeah what we don't know is the length of this particular thing. So I'm saying, uh, defining my variable as L, which will be from A to D or from B to E, correct? Mm -hmm. Now also remember this type of question is asked in different shapes. Here we have a right triangle. We could have isosceles triangle, which is not a right angle triangle. Is that clear? We could have an equilateral triangle. We could have a trapezoid at this particular case but the question is kind of same. Do you understand? Yeah. So 
I will say that being a right triangle will be simplest of all these questions. Uh, many times when we have a triangle, which is uh, not an isosceles or equilateral triangle, scalene triangle, we'll have to get into trigonometric functions yes. and find derivatives. Is that clear to you, right? Because yeah. Yeah, half AB sine theta is the area of a triangle in general. Is it okay? Half yeah. You've got to use those terms and then uh, differentiate the trigonometric functions. Correct? So till now we haven't done derivative of trigonometric functions. So we are restricting ourselves to slightly simpler ones. But the concept should be clear. That is what we need to understand today. Okay? Yeah. Now, can you read from here onwards? What are we saying? So triangle ABC is an isosceles right triangle. Yes. So ACB equals 90 degrees. Correct. Um, AC equals BC. Correct. Yeah. Um, which we label as A. Yeah. And then the length AD, we said, yeah, that's L. Correct. And so that means AC equals BC. Yeah, yeah. which is because A. And then AB is X because we said that's the variable mm -hmm. that's changing. Yeah. Now, which can change. Yes. Correct. So we have a right triangle right there and the relation between all these sides in the right triangle is Pythagorean theorem. So we know a square plus a square is x square. Simple as that. Correct? Yeah. So two sides, legs, a square, a square is x square. a plus a, a square is 2a square is x square. And we can say a square is equals to x square by 2. So we have related the side, each side, lengths, which are the legs with the hypotenuse. So we have a squared as x squared over 2. The area of the triangle, when it is a right triangle, is half base into height, right? So you have to multiply these two sides. Multiplying a yeah. with a will give you a squared. Half of that is the area, right? So, so area of this right angle triangle is half of ac times bc. ac and bc is a and a, which is a squared. We'll replace a squared by x squared by 2, right? So replacing a squared by x squared by 2, Half before that gives you the area of the triangle as x squared over 4. Is that clear to you? All right. Yeah. So we get the area of the triangle. But we have to work with the volume. Volume is 4,000 meter cube. Area times length gives you the volume. Area of the base, which is in our case, triangle, right triangle, times yeah. length is the volume. So now we have area times length as our volume. We have every term in terms of x and l. Area we just now found is x squared over 4 times l, and that should be equal to 4,000. It is given to us. Mm -hmm. That helps us to relate l with x. So l is equals to, when you plug in 4,000, multiply by 4, you get 16,000. So 16,000 over x squared is the length of this <coughs> open I will say tr trough. So we call we call this shape as a trough. T R O U G H. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So so we know how to relate all the terms. So explicitly we have related the functions in terms of x. Do you see the beauty? Earlier yeah. we found a relation that a square is equal to x square over two, and then we are saying l is equal to 16,000 over x squared. So everything is now in terms of x, right? So we can differentiate area or volume, whatever, with respect to x. x. So such questions right from here. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> moving forward, area of the rectangles. Now, when we talk about surface area, now the question is, find the minimum surface area, right? So the question says, find the minimum surface area of the tank. Now, minimum surface area is very important because it is the material cost, correct? When you make a tank, this is the material you're going to buy and you have to pay for. All right. Yeah. So material cost should be minimum. So, therefore, minimum surface area is key for optimization questions in such cases. Got it? Oh, okay. We want to maximize the volume. We say, well, we have volume of 4,000 meter cube, but we'll pay a minimum area cost correct oh. that is why these questions are always like this so one example where minimum area okay 
So to find the area, we know area will be area of these two triangles, both ends, correct? Material, correct? Another material is on the sides, the two rectangles, right? The other one on the other side, which you don't see from here. Got it? Or you could make with dotted lines, right? So we what have about, two rectangles. Yes, please. Sorry, what about the um, side one? So these are the two side ones, right? Two side ones, rectangles. So the base and the side. The, those are the top. Top, this DEF is the other side. So one triangle here, the other triangle there. You see that? I see the triangles. It's the rectangles. I can't see. One here, the one here, which is not shown. It should have been dotted. You would say you could always make it dotted. Because it's on the other side. Okay? <laughs> Wait. No, so B, C, F, and E. Yes. That's a rectangle, right? Yes. And then there's a rectangle A, D, C, F. Yes. So and there's another rectangle. A, the B, other rectangle D. Will, be, uh, will be this A, B, which looks like on the top, but not exactly. You understand this? Uh, I'll just highlight. I'll highlight in this color. Uh, not this side, but uh, I mean, it is not coming in 3D, but with this. Do you understand? The other side. So there are, there are three rectangles. Two re I mean, two on top and bottom and two on the side. Okay. Think like this. I can't see it. Think like this. Do you see the... Oh. There's one, two, and then on the top. Okay, look here, look here. Look here, Amy, look here. Yeah, I am. <laughs> These two folders, the top cover and the, the bottom cover, are the two yeah. sides. Yeah. And the open ends will be closed. So those are the other two triangles. So if we're dealing with surface area, we only deal with the top. No, no, top is open. The top is open. Oh. Right? So the open top you're not considering. It doesn't make sense to you. Oh, I didn't know it was open. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it says. Uh, it, does, it's, it does say, I think. Let me just... Uh, Erase this. Okay, let's make it simpler. Okay, let's remove those things now. Can you please read the question again? Yeah. So, um, a four thousand meter cubed water storage tank is shown with vertical isosceles right triangles at the two ends and the horizontal top A D E B. Yes. Open. I should have used the word open. Oh, okay. Um, find the minimum surface area of the tank if the width of the top AB can vary. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I thought it was closed. Yeah. All these tanks are open from the top so that you can fill up with water. Do you understand? Oh, okay. Sometimes oh, they... You always assume it's open. No, no, no it's always mentioned. I, I forgot in writing. We so actually oh, okay. cut short on you know the spacing because space is very critical. It is running out of one full page. So it becomes very difficult to explain. You get all the... Right. Yeah, like yeah, that's all right. Just and in doing so, open top it should be mentioned there correct so that's oh, okay. a good point good so we have only two rectangles on the side one here or one on the other side correct and then we have yeah. two triangles these two triangles so we have to add the area of two triangles and two rectangles basically area of the rectangle will be this particular length and side a correct yeah so area of the rectangle both are same from the symmetry so we have to multiply these two sides. Of course, they are 90 degrees. So, <clears throat> so we are saying that the rectangle area is A times L. Now we know A also in terms of X, and we know L also in terms of X, correct? So multiply those two things, so you get the area of the rectangle in terms of X, as a function of X, right? All right, yeah. Area of the triangles we already calculated, we'll just multiply that by two. So the surface area basically is two times the area of the triangles plus two times the area of these rectangles. Clear? Makes sense, yeah. So these expressions which we just worked out, just multiply them by two and simplify to get your expression for surface area of the material in this particular case. Oh, right. Slightly complicated question. Whenever you have a question with trough, it is going to be a complicated question. 
let me warn you, this is probably the simplest in that series. <laughs> okay. Nothing could be simpler than a right triangle and that two isosceles. Do you get my point, right? Yeah. Perfect. So, so you have this expression and then obviously you'll find the derivative equal to zero to get the critical number, right? And we x cube is equals to all that. Now, cube root of this, I found a decimal value, 28.284. Now, to ensure that this is minimum, you could definitely go for the second derivative, right? You already mm -hmm. have, a, and when you do the second derivative from this form of the equation, x squared, x to the power of minus two, when you do it, minus two will make this positive, right? So this oh. is the second derivative which you'll get, which is one plus positive. The derivative of x is one, correct? So one plus something, right? X yeah. is positive for you in this particular case. It's real uh, x dimension. It has to be positive. So the second derivative is always greater than zero. Since it is always greater than zero, graph is going to be up, opening up, okay. giving you a minimum. So at any critical point, you will get a minimum. Is that clear to you? Yeah. That may be required in examination to prove that this is your local minimum. Right? You could actually say this is your absolute minimum also. Can, can you tell me how? Um, because I remember you obviously saying with the quadratics, um, when you've got your local minimum, that could also be your absolute minimum point. Yes, it could be. Yes. But how do you know this is an absolute minimum? So in all real life applications, we have boundary conditions, right? In this mm -hmm. case also, we have an expression, we can say x definitely is greater than zero, right? Greater than or equal to zero, it cannot yeah. be negative. So we have a lower boundary for it, correct? We are saying that in our expression, that x is equal to 16,000 over L, right? So we have a value. What could be the maximum value of L? x we could actually get that value also but at both the extremes in this particular case you can find the value so you have a boundary condition so you all right so when you have a boundary condition you have to find the value of the function at both the boundaries and at the critical number also oh, we have to do like the interval table uh, not really you have to find oh. the value at three places correct oh yeah yeah i remember now yeah sorry absolute maximum minimum so your critical number is only one which is 28.284 in this case right mm -hmm. and boundary condition gives you zero surface area if i just make flatten this out if i just flatten this it be oh, yeah. is that clear to you yeah that is how we could actually kind of get it but anyway second derivative also tells you for sure that this particular case here is our absolute minimum. If not absolute, at least we have local minimum, right? We have one minimum value with which we can work. So the minimum surface area will be substitute this particular decimal value into your equation. Since, uh, you know, you could also substitute 16,000 square root to cube root because x cube is equal to that, correct? Oh, yeah. Complicated. Don't forget that. Complicated, right? x cube is that much. So x is only equal to 28.284, perfect? Yeah. When you substitute, you actually get a very good number, which is 400 plus 800, which is 1200. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, very good numbers, yeah. Uh, in the exam, when we, so when we find that value of x, do we have to then um, like test whether that is the minimum value or can we just assume that it is? Okay. In the exam, there will be a statement written here. If that statement says, do not test the value, that means do not test the value. Oh. What if that statement is missing? You have yeah. to test for minimum. And in this particular case, second derivative is the best option. Oh, okay. Got it? Yeah. So you have to be very careful. If that statement is there, you don't have to. Otherwise, you see, it just takes a minute. To be safe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it, right? Not awesome. a difficult thing to do. Now, I mean, did you understand this solution? Yeah, I did. Can you explain me in short how do we approach to solve 
any problem based on a trough. This shape is called a trough, where we could have rectangle, we could have square, we could have a triangle of any shape on the mm. edge. We could even have a rhombus. You understand? We could have a semi-circle type of a thing also. Any shape they can give you, but the concept is going to be same. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So um, I think we should start by like labeling um, mm -hmm. the sides and things. Um, so like we did, we read the question and saw that it's isosceles. So you find obviously the two of the lengths would be the same. And because it says um, AB, so the length AB can vary, we're going to say that's going to be, uh, we call that length X because we're trying to differentiate with respect to X. Um, so then you use the values that we have chosen and like make little little equations kind of things um, so that when we make like obviously the bigger equations like area of a triangle when, when you find one of those like values like a squared equals x squared over 2 we can just sub that value back in and um, that's what we did with the volume as well so now we've got two different um, equations that we can work with so the area being x squared over 4 and the volume being um, x squared over 4 times the length yep um, and we know what the volume is because uh, it's told in the question so we just sub that value back in and um, we get the length as 16,000 over x squared um, so now we have to find the area of the rectangles so that would just be um, Length into width. Yeah, yeah, length times width. So we do x over root 2, and we got that from the x squared over 2. Yes. And we just um, found x. No, we found a, sorry, because that's a squared. You just root, you just square root that. Yeah. Um, and then you times that, and we get the area of the rectangle being 16,000 over root 2 times x. Mm. So now we've got all our um, equations on the side we're asked to find the minimum surface area. So the surface area equation, because it's an open top, all you need is um, obviously the two triangles on the side, opposite ends. So that would be two times the, tri the area of the triangle. So we've got 2A. And then it would be add the two rectangles on the side. So that would be 2R. So we just um, sub the values in. Um, simplified it and got s equals x squared over 2 plus root 2 times 16,000 over x. Yeah. Um, now we have to find uh, the first derivative. Um, so when you do that, you get 1 over x. Simplify this. Get yeah. a number, correct? Yeah. And then you just um, find x and um, then sub that value into the main equation and you'll get your answer. That is so true. You can also then test the point by using the second derivative. Clear. So with this actually, you will do the toughest question in your test paper. Remember, this shape could be different, right? Okay, yeah. Another very popular question right here. Minimize the area of a frame. Now again, a material is involved. So whenever a material is involved, the material cost should be minimum. And what is that material doing? Holding something that will maximize the volume. That will be the case, right? So in this case, Amy, can you read the question, please? Yeah. So a wooden frame with perimeter of two meters has a rectangle base X by Y with a semicircle on top as shown in the figure. Find the dimensions of the frame to maximize the area enclosed. Very good. It could be a window, for example, right? You want maximum yeah. to come in and that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that is your question and the approach should be we need to again somehow relate these x and y's right we want explicitly all our area terms in terms of one variable that is what we're looking for correct and wow. to help us we are given perimeter as two meters so the approach is find what perimeter is perimeter is outside that is perimeter perfect so x times y I mean, is the size of the rectangle. So we have x here, y and y. So that is 2y, correct? Now here, yeah. the diameter is x. We know semicircle. Pi d is the circumference. Half of pi d, d diameter is x, gives you that part also. 
So we know that the perimeter is x plus, this is your x, plus 2y, these two sides, correct? Plus half of pi d, pi diameter, which is x for you, correct? So the right, yes. expression for perimeter is there for you. This is equal to 2 meters. So we equate that to 2 meters. You can see this equation in terms of x and y. You can now write y in terms of x. So we have written all the variables in this example in terms of x. That is our first step. Mm -hmm. Once we have everything in terms of x, we can now find the area. Area is simple. Area of the light which is coming from this particular frame or anything for that matter area of a rectangle is x times y and half of pi r squared is the semicircle area right yeah. so x times y and half of pi r is radius is half of x whole square only thing which we have to do is replace this y value with what we just found so that we explicitly have a function in terms of x does it make sense yeah simplify this particular expression since before i mean before simply uh, doing derivative you should simplify so we had this fraction part two four eight and all these things and here we have plus x squared over four four times two is eight do you see that so to simplify we just take one eighth common factor x is also common in the numerator as you can see so we took x over eight as a common factor no fractions here. Simple oh, state right. polynomial type. Yeah. Eight minus 4x minus 2 pi x plus pi x. These two are like terms. They can be combined. And once you combine them, you get minus pi x. Correct? Oh. Which I written here, area now is x over 8 times within bracket 8 minus 4x minus pi x. Is that clear to you? Yeah. Perfect. So we have this equation, we need to find the minimum uh, and maximum, local maximum minimum. That means we have to go for the derivative. Correct? So derivative, you could apply the product rule and use that formula, which we just got in factored form, or open the bracket, no harm, open the bracket, right? And then uh -huh. apply the power rule. So I prefer to use power rule rather than the product rule. It could be very confusing. So I had definitely simplified my expression to write it in this form. But when I want to do the derivative, I'll rather expand it in terms of three terms, x minus half x squared minus pi x squared over eight, and then find the derivative. See how simple it is? Derivative oh, yeah. of x is one. x squared means two x and two, two cancel minus x. And the third one, two cancels with eight, giving you four in the denominator and pi x over four is your first derivative for the area. And definitely we want to equate that to zero to find the critical number and there you go. So we get this expression for area. So here, looking at the question actually speaking, you see this four x minus pi x. So if I multiply by four, I get four x minus pi x. You get this. All right, yeah. If I take this one multiply by four, I know this term is equal to 4. This term is equal to 4. 8 minus 4 is 4. 4 divided by 8 is 2. x over 2 is that value. You understand how yes. calculations become when we try to see what we are writing. Is that okay? Anyway, yeah, yeah. we'll continue. First step, always avoid fractions. So I just multiplied everything by 4 in this particular case. So I get 4 here for 1, right? Multiplied by 4. Yes. And then minus 4x minus x pi equals to 0. From here, I can isolate x, 4x plus pi x equals to 4, taking x common, and then dividing by x 4 plus pi. I get the x value. Is it okay? Makes sense, yeah. So that is my critical number, x value. Now, to show that this is a local maximum or minimum, I'll definitely go for the second derivative. And second derivative, as you can see here, from here, second derivative, Right? All are negative terms. Derivative of 1 is 0. So we get all negative terms means it is less than 0. Concave down means maximum critical number, right? So maximum area. It does make sense to you. Yeah. Now, we know that, that this critical sense. number corresponds to maximum. Now the idea is what is the area? Fine. Just substitute this value of x 
into your formula, right? <clears throat> and calculate. If you want simpler, oh, yeah, yeah. Factors, then observe that 4x, this term, 4x minus 5 is actually 4, right? Do you see this? Wait, wait, sorry, uh, 4? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So, so I you just minus common it is plus, right? So uh, oh. you substitute this value of x at three different places and you know, try to solve it. It'll take five yeah. minutes. But if you observe like this, you will only write four here as I have written four. Do you see that four here? All oh, right. Yes, yeah, so you wouldn't bother writing all of that fraction thing. Yeah, and for oh. that x, I'm writing four over four this value. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. So I've really saved on so many steps at this particular stage and got the right answer right there before you. Oh, but that saved so much time. Yes. Hmm. So quite... I think there's a typing error here also. So we get this 8 here. So we have 16 on the top and 8 on the top. So when I divide, I should get 2. So this is not, this is 2. Sorry for that. <coughs> okay, so the area which you get here is uh, 2 over 4 plus pi, not, okay, M. Uh, yeah. yeah. See, 8 minus 4 is 4, correct? Mm -hmm. 4 times 4 is 16. Oh, yeah, yeah. By eight, 16 by 8, you get 2. two. Right, so I should have written 2 here. When you 2 count. at the top. Oh, okay, yeah. 2 at the top. I actually copied from here 4 and just left that value. It should be 2 over this, right? So the right answer will be A is 2 over 4 plus pi meters square. Include mm -hmm. units in your final answer. Is that clear to you? Yeah, makes sense. So a couple of things to learn at this stage. While you're solving, you should see we have factored, we have expanded. You see, we factor, we expand. We keep both the things together. We are giving us different information. You see, we factored, we expanded. Do you see that? Yeah. We factor, we expand. Because it is easier to find derivative when you expand. That's true, yeah. And when you factor, it is easier to calculate. So, so both, uh, both the ways are important. So keep them together. And use the one which is better for this situation. All right. Yeah. Key. You get the idea, right? Yeah. So with that, we kind of conclude optimization. So we had the last two examples, which are basically optimization, because what we are trying to do, we are optimizing the cost. We are optimizing the volume. We are optimizing the area. We are optimizing the effectivity. So in all real life situations, optimization is key. And we have used all the principles learned so far in solving real life situations like optimization in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And you see how effective it is, correct? Yeah. You feel comfortable doing such questions now? Yeah, definitely. It's making a lot of sense. Perfect. So now let's... Um, try to understand what Emmy has understood from today's lecture. So I was not sharing with you the screen, but I want to see what you recall uh, for today's lesson. Yes, Emmy, can you summarize what have we learned today? Yeah, so we first started with the, um, just like the key concepts of, so let's say F prime X, if it's greater than zero, we know F of X is increasing. Um, F prime X less than zero, F of X is decreasing. F prime X equal to zero is a stationary point. Um, and then we talked about the second derivative. So um, F, so the second derivative, how do you, how do you say it statement wise? Second derivative, second derivative okay. is okay. Second derivative um, being greater than zero, we said it's concave up. Okay. Um, and second derivative being less than zero, concave down. And then second derivative equal to zero, um, you got your point of inflection. You could. Oh, you could. If it is like concave up, down, up. or up, it is. If it is either way, it is. But it could be oh, both yeah. ways, it is not in that case, right? You have to oh, tell. Yeah. 
So with point of inflection, your point of inflection is there. If the oh, second yeah. derivative is zero, yes, you have to test. Yes, yeah, so that change of concavity is very important. So Always test. test. Yeah. Okay. Um, then you talked about, um, which was a really key point I thought uh, towards the end about um, factoring and expanding. Mm -hmm. How keeping them like as a pair going down through your workings because obviously, um, so like Sir said, uh, when you expand. Um, it's easier to do the first derivative and find um, calculations. And if you have in factored form, um, it's much easier to calculate um, different like things that are going to be involved. Yeah. It's much easier than in like a standard form, let's say. That is true. Um, so we're just trying to, in the lesson, we were thinking of ways to save time, um, but using all the working that we've got like um in many questions i saw how there was so much working but um that in between there were bits that would help me later on but i would have i wouldn't have seen that i would have just gone for the complicated version when there are quick like things to sub in so don't like after you do like working out don't just ignore it and be like okay that's done now i've got my answer i'm not going to look back again so you've got to keep like referring back to things and make your working out clear so you can refer back to it um and yeah that was actually really helpful so um yeah optimization i'm okay. gonna go do my questions in a book now for yeah. sure and we also learned about how, how to deal with the cubic equation one of the critical oh, yeah. questions if you could summarize about the cubic equation learning oh yeah that was really helpful so with the cubic uh, equation um finding because that's a polynomial we don't really like work with a lot so finding the point of inflection um so let's say if it was in a standard form so the ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d um finding the point of inflection you just need to do um x equals minus b over 3a perfect so yep. that would be the formula that you'd use. You can easily do it, like in multiple choice questions, be really quick. And if it was in factored form, um, you would do x equals, uh, so let's say you had your, the real, the x-intercepts, yeah. Um, so you just do p plus q plus r, whole thing over three. Correct, that's yeah. right. <laughs> the average of the thing, right? Got it. This is all we did today and you got it all. That's great. So I would like you to take up now uh, some questions from GCSC exam, real exam papers. Yes. I also have many salt papers. I'll share with you some of those salt papers so, so that you understand what type of questions are expected from this particular part of your curriculum. And mm -hmm. I really hope that you score more than 90% marks in this particular mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah okay then so we'll close here and um, right. in the next class i think we'll still take optimization in the next class and okay. then we'll talk about some other topics uh, later is that clear yeah perfect thank you so much sir my pleasure i really appreciate it have a great day Andy. yeah you too sir thank you, thank you.